Um, I'll start by just introducing myself. My name is Michelle Berger, and I go by the, nick the nickname of Buff Mother. Um, that's because I have four kids. I had all four of them in four years. I had twins, I had a C-section, and then I transformed my body and got back into Ooh. shape. And so I, I wanted to tell the world about it. So I started a website named buffmother.com, and I've been online now for probably about 11 years. And through that time, I've had the opportunity to coach thousands of women, interact with almost probably a million more, and uh, be able to uh, really learn a lot about the struggles of women dealing with their hormones. And so the way that um, I train women is a little different than the typical, I take into account your natural hormonal cycle. Now, whether you still have a cycle or if you're you know, in, that, in, in menopause, of course, you don't think you have a cycle, but you actually do. You still have a hormonal cycle. So I teach women that there's definitely ways you can work with your hormones to help you be more consistent in your fitness efforts. And then if you're consistent, then that's when you get results. So with everything that I'm talking about tonight, I'm going to take it as a view of a fitness professional, a little bit more than a medical doctor. So some of the information we're going to be covering is deep because that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to teach you about thyroid and insulin. And there's some medical terms here. Some of it I'll just kind of skip over. You can read the slide. I'll explain it in just general terms. That's something I very much pride myself on, taking things that's very complicated and making them very simple so that we can apply the information to our life and help it, it make us better. So that said, um, my uh, raffle prize tonight includes a, a couple of the books that I've written, this cute little backpack. Um, so I've written a book uh, called Hormonal Timing. And it's basically how to train uh, using just a dumbbell, a ball, and uh, a chair at your, in your house. And you can get in really, really good shape using the program in here. And then I have a book, uh, After Baby Abs, specifically for your tummies. And then I also have a DVD system. And this is used as bands. And I know some of you might have some. I know Tammy was including it in some of the packages. And uh, so we have um, those and some supplements and this cute little backpack as our giveaway prize today. Now, all this stuff is available on my website also, which is buffmother.com. <coughs> And that's all one word, B-U-F-F-M-O-T-H-E-R dot com. So, so that's my commercial for tonight. Uh, <laughs> now, and if you all have these little cards too, you can, you can write questions on there and really about anything. Okay, mainly what we're going to talk about today is insulin and thyroid. Now, uh, these two substances are powerful regulators. Now, they are hormones, and I like to call hormones regulators because that's what they do in your body. They regulate all sorts of different processes. Now both thyroid and insulin hormones have a lot of the same effects when they're in dysfunction. When they're not working properly in your body, you have some of the very similar uh, issues of weight gain, lethargy, fuzzy brain, painful extremities, arthritis, high blood pressure. Other hormones are out of balance because these are not in balance. So you, have, you can have the digestive issues, cravings, uh, libido problems, sleep problems, more allergies, and uh, you know puffiness around the eyes, water retention, depression, and inability to recover from physical activity. This is huge. If I have a client that just cannot ever seem to get over their soreness and they just cannot recover, a lot of times it's due to one of these two hormones being out of whack. And Finally, it lowers your immune function. Now, there's many other symptoms, but these two are very common to both insulin and thyroid disorders. So now let's just start with insulin. Okay, we're gonna talk about insulin, and then we'll talk about thyroid, and then we'll open up the floor for some questions. Now, insulin is uh, produced in your body by the pancreas, okay? It regulates your blood sugar. It's very good to have insulin in your body, okay? It, it stimulates storage of, of energy. It stores carbohydrates um, in your liver, in your muscles, and it also stimulates fat production. So that's where we run into problems. If your insulin is high, you're gonna have more fat storage on your body. And the more fat storage you have in your body, the more your body wants to store fat, and it just keeps on snowballing. 
So um, another thing with insulin, it signals your body to make other hormones. Like I talked about, if your insulin is out of whack, some of your other hormones are gonna be out of whack. So um, it's also anabolic. Now this is very interesting. Do you know that bodybuilders, like the really humongous bodybuilder guys, they inject insulin, even though they're not diabetic, just for its anabolic properties. It's pretty crazy. It's one of the most dangerous things that they do. Them taking steroids is dangerous, but them shooting up insulin is way more dangerous. And that is very toxic to their system, especially when you don't need the extra insulin, and they use it for anabolic purposes. But knowing that, having it be anabolic, which means it causes your body to grow, is very uh, good for, if you make sure your insulin is in correct levels, you are gonna find that you your skin looks younger, your hair is growing properly, your your body has some muscle and shape to it. Whereas if you your insulin is out of whack, or it, 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 it's too high, then you're gonna find that you know, aging comes early. And we, all of us want to stay young forever, right? <laughs> I, I know I do. Okay, so it also helps blood flow and temperature, which regulates you, uh, you know, if you're too hot or too cold, and also blood flow, that, that um, really plays into your blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, you wanna make sure that you're keeping your insulin in check. All right, it also influences brain, and then it's, it has a counterpart regulator, which is glucagon. So I just have to mention that quickly. So insulin stores energy in your body, where glucagon helps release it. So say you have, you know, you, you haven't eaten for a while, glucagon comes to work, comes to rescue, and it starts uh, enabling your body to burn fat for fuel, and also sometimes it causes to take maybe even protein off your own body and burn that for fuel. So there's, you know, either one in excess is not good. So what we, we want to do is just keep everything as much on an even keel as possible. All right, so when insulin is not working properly, we have two scenarios. We have the extreme scenario of diabetes. There's a you know a couple different types of diabetes, and I'm sure most of you are aware of, of that. Type one is when your body does not make insulin anymore, or very, you know, like very minimal amounts. That's basically when your pancreas is not working correctly and uh, you do not produce insulin anymore. So uh, that usually happens, usually is juvenile onset diabetes. Most people get that type of diabetes when they're younger, you know, under the age of 20, they become diagnosed, but it can happen in adults. So don't, you know, don't ever think, well, it's not that, because there's several adults that have adult onset diabetes. And uh, so if you are experiencing, you know, some of the side effects, which is extreme thirst, extreme weight loss, um, just really, you know, crazy blood sugar amounts, you know, and, and you're worried about that, make sure to check check it out. But there's also type two diabetes, and that's what we find more prevalent in this age group. Um, it is a lot of times caused by um, lifestyle factors and choices that we make about what we eat and how we spend our time and we exercise or not. And uh, so definitely type two diabetes, and, and the problem is too much sugar in the, in the bloodstream because there's no insulin or because your body is not using the insulin or is not able to receive the insulin. What happens in type two diabetes, you have receptors in your, in your cells that are insulin receptors and for some reason, they don't understand anymore that they're supposed to take a hold of this insulin. And so what happens is you have raised blood sugar in your body and that causes all sorts of issues, especially and mostly inflammation type issues because it's these big cells floating around in your bloodstream just ripping everything apart in there. So you get joint pain, you get really sluggish, you don't have any energy, you just want to sleep all the time. And so the problem is having that extra sugar in your blood. So the solution is that you need to take control and do things to ensure that your insulin and blood sugars are under control. So we can do things in our diet and our exercise to do that. So the other end of the spectrum is called insulin resistance. Okay, not the other end, but it's, it's before you get to diabetes, okay? Now, if you have diabetes, you don't want that. You don't want that diagnosis. You don't want to have to, you know, be labeled as diabetic. You don't want to, you don't want to get there. 
But insulin resistance, if it starts with insulin resistance. Okay, so once your body starts not understanding that that insulin is supposed to receptive to those cells in your body, then you're going to find uh, what we what's been termed metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. And a lot of that is, is to do with weight gain, a lot of belly fat, inability to use your uh, your fat stores properly, and just it just snowballs on itself. So um, some of the insulin resistance can be caused by other diseases and other syndromes, one of which is very interesting is PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now that, you always think of that as like, uh, um, actually a lot of people don't even know what that is. <laughs> Who all knows what PCOS is in here? Okay, very few people do, and I don't, I don't really, I found that out just over the last couple of years when I've been talking about it more, is that a lot of women have never even heard of it, they don't even know what it is. Well, it's basically when your body, as a female, produces more androgenic hormones than, than normal. And for some reason, um, you just end up with uh, you know, certain side effects because of that. Now, one of the best things you can do to erase that problem is by keeping your blood sugars in control. So, or actually to control that problem is to keep your blood sugars in control. So PCOS causes insulin resistance, but it also can be helped by the same things that we do to help diabetes and, and um, insulin resistance. So, um, basically, insulin resistance is a you know a major epidemic right now. A lot of people you know, we're finding more and more people every day being diagnosed with diabetes. But there's even more that are insulin resistant. As a trainer, I run into people all the time that I would say are insulin resistant. Their bodies just don't respond anymore properly to a re even a really good diet. You know, they have, you know, like, I don't eat bad, but I just keep on gaining weight. You know, that's one of the biggest complaints that I hear. You know, I work out and just nothing happens. I plateau. It doesn't, it doesn't do me any good. And they get frustrated and they just quit. So the big thing that I know with insulin resistance is that it's been caused by just overconsumption of sugars in our diet. And even good things, you know, like breads, and uh, you know vegetables like corn or mashed potatoes, you know certain things like that. If we have way too much of that and not some of the other stuff, we end up with just too much sugar in our system, and pretty soon our body just says enough. I can't deal with all this sugar, and then it, the insulin resistance occurs. So the solution is once again that you need to control your insulin and blood sugars. It's up to us to take control. And, and monitor that and know, know what we're doing in our food intake and things. So, real quick, we'll just go over tests, the tests for insulin and blood sugar. Um, one of the best tests that I've been aware of is the A1C test. That basically gives you a three month glimpse into what your blood sugar's been doing. And so it's been used a lot for uh, diabetics. Say you go to the doctor, you find out you're diabetic, the doctor's like, okay, come back in three months, I'm gonna check your A1C again, and see if you're actually doing what the nutritionist told you to do. And if they haven't had any good changes, then a lot of times then they have to take more drastic measures like prescriptions or, or um, even uh, doing insulin injections and things like that. So that's the A1C test. And uh, the next one is uh, fasting plasma glucose. Now that's just basically another blood test that you get done. Um, at the doctor's office if you go in for your fasting blood draw. They just want to see where you're at with that. Now there's the oral glucose tolerance test. Now if any of you ladies have ever had a baby, pretty much all of us have had the glucose tolerance test, just the basic uh, short one where you drink this yucky orange liquid and then you get tested 30 minutes later to see what your blood, blood is showing. Now what happens is if, if your A1C is high and is your if your fasting plasma glucose is high and your fasting insulin is high, when you go get your blood test, your doctor's gonna be like, I have to go, I'm gonna have you take the glucose tolerance test. Now, it's not the short little one that pregnant ladies do, it's the long one. It's three hours long, you drink a ton of this sugary gross stuff, you get your blood drawn every 30 minutes, and it's just, it is all day long, horrible situation. But they basically wanna find out if you have diabetes or not. So, if you get to that point, then you know they're really concerned that you possibly do have diabetes. And then of course there's glucose monitors and self-awareness. You know some of the symptoms, if you, if you are just like really feeling sluggish, you really, you know, say like if you eat something 
instead of being energized, you feel like you just want to go lay down and you're going to go into coma. You know, or if, if you eat a big meal and you go, like, oh, I should be so full, and then all of a sudden you're starving, you feel like just these horrible hunger pains, that's all a sign of insulin resistance, that your, your body is not processing those sugars correctly. And uh, you know, another big thing that I know is if you wake up and you just feel like there's sludge in your veins, just like you know, your body's so stiff that you know, for no reason, of course, you know, like if you haven't even worked out or anything, you just feel like you can't hardly move. A lot of that is because of the glucose and the inflammation that it causes in your system. So real quick, let's just show you this, this um, the levels. So for instance, the A1C test here, um, if you're 6.5 or above, you're considered diabetic, okay? Pre-diabetes pre is 5.7 to 6.4. Now normal is at five. So there's a big area in there that's not even covered. Five to 5.7, that's where you're starting to have some insulin resistance. The closer you get to 5.7, the closer you are to having really strong insulin resistance. And that's when you like, that's when you should take control. That's when you should be like, hey, my insulin is not working correctly. I need to stay, you know, start taking some action. Say so, so the other mem other levels you can see, um, you know, they're not as uh, understandable <laughs> as the A1C. But when you get your A1C test back, that's very good information to know. Okay, now um, this is for if you do the glucose monitor. And just for instance, you can see how the bigger difference is when you're diabetic. In the red there how high those numbers are. Even when you wake up in the morning, you're at 126 uh, of, of the blood glucose number. Now that's really high, and uh, but diabetics, that's a reality for them. And if you, you know, are you know, concerned, or if the doctor thinks that you might have diabetes, getting a glucose monitor is, it's like 40 bucks, and you can you know, test yourself as often as you want to, and kind of see how it goes. And then if you do have, diabetes, you need to be testing because you don't ever want, you don't want your ranges to be really high ever. It's just, uh, it just causes so many problems. So just kind of a little graphic there to help you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put this, um, I'll be putting this um, PowerPoint on my website too. So if you guys ever, if you want it afterwards, you can, you can do that. Okay. So um, my point in all of, in telling you all of this it is very important for you to control your insulin and blood sugar. Now, just with basic knowledge, uh, you know, and it's just a lot of what you've been learning in, in these classes. It's all the same thing. We have to be our own health advocates. We need to take control. So in your diet, there's some basic rules that you want to try to follow to help control your insulin and blood sugar. So you want to definitely decrease your sugar intake and your carbohydrates. So, and that includes breads and grains and pastas and things like that. Those are sugars. They turn into sugar in your body. So the more you can control those items, the more you'll, you'll find that your blood sugar and your insulin levels will remain more constant. And that's what we want. Okay, you want to definitely increase your protein intake. Uh, because, of course, if you're not eating a lot of carbohydrates, you have to eat something, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you want to get protein. You also want to eat vegetables. And I am a big proponent for what I call greens, which are water-based vegetables. They're the ones that pretty much have tons of fiber in them, water, and vitamins, and nothing else. And so they are so good. And if you increase your vegetables, you'll be automatically increasing your fiber. And then, uh, basically, the next thing you want to do also is increase your fat intake. Now I know that kind of sounds odd, but <laughs> you definitely don't want to take all the fat out of your diet because if you don't eat fat, your food, your carbohydrates and your protein, they absorb so much faster without the little bit of fat in that food than if the fat was in that food. So what you want to do is let the food be in your stomach a little bit longer and the best way to do that is to eat some fat. So if you eat fat, protein and maybe some green vegetables in your stomach, it'll take longer for all that to digest. Thus, your insulin spike, your sugar spikes won't happen so much. It'll take longer for them to get in your bloodstream and therefore you won't see the spikes and you'll have more constant energy. Plus, you won't be so hungry. Eating fat satiates you a lot to where you just get any kinds of fat. 
No, not not like fried foods, definitely not. But, but fat, it, fat is good for you. Fat is um, very important, vital nutrients are in fat. So we want some saturated fat, you know, minimal amount, but good fats like avocado, olives, nuts, oils, and cheeses, all of that stuff is very good for you. Now, don't be afraid of saturated fat either. You do need saturated fat in order to make your hormones correctly. All hormones are created from cholesterol, which is in saturated fat, which in turn you make your hormones from. So if you don't have enough fat in your diet, you're going to find that your hormone production can be, um, you know, impacted negatively. You won't, you won't get as many hormones naturally being built if you don't have proper fats in your diet. So of course, we don't want to be eating fried, you know, like deep fat fried foods. We don't want to be eating a bunch of vegetable oil and stuff like that, but good, healthy foods. You just got to think about what is healthful, what is natural, what, you know, what did God put on this earth versus what did man, hydrogenated oils, all that kind of stuff. You, you want to stay away from those. But another thing you can think about with in your dieting is um, called intermittent fasting. It's kind of a buzzword right now. I don't know if um, any of you have ever had anybody tell you, oh, you shouldn't eat after 8 o'clock at night. Anybody heard that before? That's basically intermittent fasting. They just want you to not be eating as long. <laughs> so you stop eating at 8, you don't eat till 8 in the morning, you've not eaten for 12 hours. That's more than a lot of people. A lot of people eat till midnight, get up at 8, so that's only 8 hours that they haven't been eating. So you, you want, you know, you increase your, your amount of time that you're fasting. Also, you can do that, say if you're a nighttime eater, I'm a nighttime eater. You know, I like eating at night, right? I've just accepted the fact. <laughs> so, what I do is I don't eat right away in the morning. I'll, you know, kind of push off breakfast till later because I'm just honestly not very hungry. And I hate trying to force myself to eat a whole bunch in the morning anyway. So, I'll, I'll you know, extend my fast in the morning sometimes. But sometimes not. Yeah, you know, I listen to my body. If I'm starving, I'll, I'm going to eat. So, Anyway, uh, another, another key factor is timing of meals. Now, if you've heard this many times, the best way to eat is small little meals throughout the day. Keep your blood sugar um, level, your insulin levels level. And that is, you know, very optimal. If we lived in, like, in a utopia, we'd all be, you know, every three hours we'd take a break to eat, right? But, you know, the best thing to do is to learn your own biorhythms. Learn, like I said, learn when you're hungry, learn when you're not, learn what true hunger is. And it just makes sure that you're timing your meals in a regular interval so that you don't go crazy. You know, the basic diet information, you know, just don't starve yourself for, you know, seven hours and then, you know, pig out at supper. So, all right, the other way you can control blood sugar is through exercise. And it is, uh, you know, we look at exercise as a bad word sometimes. It's not. It's just what we're, what we're supposed to do. Our bodies are made to move. So you just definitely want to increase movement. Something that I've done for the last couple of years is I've created myself a standing workstation. So I stand up when I'm working behind the computer. And it was really hard at first because <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm tired, I want to sit down, you know. And then, you know, as I did it, as I got, you know, more into it, by a month into it, I'm like, this is awesome. You know, so I stand up behind the computer when I'm working at the computer most of the time. I can't say I'm 100% on that. but. But definitely, it, it helps. It just helps me stay strong. It helps movement. Uh, you know, so just little things like that. And just making rules, like every once in a while, I'll make a rule, like I'm not gonna sit down until you know noon or whatever. So I'm running around the house cleaning and just doing whatever, chores, errands, whatever it is. And uh, so just in, being conscious of increasing your movement is, is the first step. The second thing that I recommend is weight training. <laughs> I know all of you might be, you know, weight training, there's a little bit of a, a learning curve. Weight training, resistance training, any even body weight training, that is all really good at improving your insulin sensitivity. Having those muscles work, having them contract, having them need nutrients allows your insulin to be more effective in those muscle cells. And so, and also it helps get rid of the waste that are ruining your insulin sensitivity. So say for instance you have your cell and it's got all these wastes in it from not exercising, not moving, and having a toxic diet, and then you exercise. So you squeeze this, all the toxins out of your body and then it's ready to get the insulin in there now. It says, okay, I'll take the insulin now. That's basically the simplest way to, to put it. 
you're, you want to create your body expelling waste and absorbing the information that they need from the insulin. So aerobic fitness, of course, that's anything that gets your heart rate up, you know, up to, they say if it's up 50%, that's aerobic activity. Anything that gets a heart rate up for an extended period of time, everybody should be doing that, especially if you have any insulin resistance, because it helps burn off the extra sugars. Okay, so your liver, for instance, at night, it, it releases glucose into your body. That's why those diabetics still have high blood sugar even when they wake up in the morning when they haven't been eating all day long, all night long. So what you need to do a lot of times to help get those blood sugars down is get some exercise. And it's okay to go ahead and get some exercise on an empty stomach. That's what they call fasted cardio. So it'll help lower that blood sugar down, help increase your insulin resistance, and it will help your body absorb the food once you do eat, you know, after, you know, like say if you wait, get up at seven, go for a walk at 7.30, come home and eat at eight, wonderful. Because your blood sugar has gone down, you have, you're ready to eat, and then it, you'll, you'll um, absorb those carbohydrates so much better. And the food, and, and actually you can get, just to make clear, this clear, you can have sugar in your bloodstream even if you don't eat any carbohydrates at all. Your body will make glucose out of your muscles, it will make it out of protein, it will make it out of fat. The process is called gluconeogenesis. So even if you don't eat any carbohydrates whatsoever, you can still have elevated blood sugars. So don't think, well I need, I need fuel, I need energy, so I have to eat this carbohydrate to be able to have energy to work out. Your body is very very intelligent. <laughs> so it will make uh, blood sugar when it absolutely needs to have it. So, all right. And then um, timing of your exercise is important. Um, very important. Make sure that you've eaten something. Like, if it, as long as it's not first thing in the morning, that's the only time you ever have permission to work out without eating anything, okay? Because you have elevated blood sugars from the liver releasing it overnight. Otherwise, you need to make sure you've eaten within two hours prior to your workout because that, and you're just going to have a horrible time. You're gonna, it's going to feel horrible. It's gonna, you're not going to have any energy. You're going to be weak. You're going to be tired. You're going to be hungry. And you're just not going to feel very good. Now, the, that's a lot of times why people run into problems when they're exercising, why they think it's so horrible, is because they're so depleted that they're trying to work out and do all this stuff when they have absolutely no energy in your system. The point of working out is to be productive when you're working out. It's supposed to be doing something that's building your body, building your system, and, and helping you be stronger. How can you do that when you have absolutely nothing left in your body to do it with? So make sure you eat two hours before you work out, and then after you work out, also make sure you eat something. You need to refuel your body, you need to give your body nutrients to be, rebuild itself, and so that you can feel good the next day, and so that you can recover from your workouts. All right, so basically, <coughs> There's other ways you can control your insulin and blood sugar. Supplements, there's a huge list right here. We have chromium, B12, CLA, magnesium, ALA, cinnamon, and d tyro in the subtle, <laughs> fenugreek extract, and then your basic vitamins, D, E, biotin, zinc, fish oil, and a probiotic. All of those things can help your blood sugar. So don't think that just because you have blood sugar or issues or insulin resistance that you have to instantly get on medication. Some of these things will definitely help your supplements, you know, just over the counter, make sure you get really good quality ones, but, um, and definitely make sure that you don't start taking them all at once. <laughs> you wanna just be very you know, selective, take one, see how you feel, uh, try, to, you know, try another one the next week or whatever it is. I know I, I took cinnamon for a while, and I was, I didn't like it because it gave me these nasty herbs. <laughs> so, so I was like, oh, I'm not gonna do that one anymore. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of finding the things that work. You don't have to do them all, but certain ones really, really do help. Now, um, the medication, of course, if you have type one diabetes and really advanced type two, you, you may be prescribed insulin. Type one most often always has to have type uh, insulin but um, type two, very, you know, if you do well in your diet and your exercise and some of the other medications, a lot of times you don't need any insulin. So um, the, other one, the other ones listed here, you know, there's very technical names. 
the first one I want to point out is metformin. Metformin, you've probably heard of it before if you had had any diabetic friends or anyone that has insulin resistance even. A lot of doctors pre uh, uh, prescribe metformin. It basically helps your body absorb the in insulin uh, and uh, actually helps your body move the sugars into your cells just like insulin does. And then also it helps uh, prevent the liver from releasing quite so much stored glucose so that your blood sugar stays a little more steady. Um, the other ones, they're just, I just listed them there just so you know that there's alternatives. Say if you take, if you, if you're struggling with this and, and you want to try, you know, some sort of medication, be in conversation with your doctor about it. Um, definitely, uh, you know, combine the diet and exercise portion, but if you're still having issues, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with taking some medicine, but at the same time, know that they all do have side effects. So if you have side effects from one, know that there's always, most often, another alternative that you could try instead. Is, is there's no reason to be living through a bunch of side effects um, of medication. So, so that's pretty much um, insulin. Does anybody have any questions specifically to insulin right now? Then we're gonna move into thyroid. Okay. Um, when I first started dogs, they had me on the acne. Uh huh. Then I started seeing the TV commercial. Oh. Um, yeah. I, here, I think there's a TV day. commercial for every medicine out there. Yeah. <laughs> She's saying that she started seeing the warnings on the commercials for uh, one of the medicines that she had been taking, and and you know, like I said, there's side effects on every medicine. And there's some that have, you know, if it's really bad, they'll take it off the market completely. You know, the FDA doesn't let the really bad drugs stay in circulation. Mm -hmm. So, works better. Yeah. Okay. All right, now we're going to go to thyroid. Um, thyroid is a little more complicated in a lot of different, I mean, both of them are very complicated. Both of them, are, like I said, are major regulators in your body. Thyroid um, is, uh, if you don't know, thyroid is located just under your Adam's apple on your neck. And it's a butterfly gland right in here. And so if someone has a goiter, that you'll see, you know, if you've ever seen anyone with a, with a goiter, that's related to thyroid disease or a thyroid issue. Your thyroid produces uh, T4 and T3. And uh, basically, it controls your metabolism. So it, it, it accelerates cellular reaction, increases your oxygen metabolism, increases your energy production, which is ATP. It also increases your body temperature. So uh, you know you can see if you have certain side effects, you know, like real, I'm really cold all the time, or I'm really sluggish all the time. You know, those are those are signs that you might have uh, thyroid dysfunction. Um, BMR, which is your basal metabolic rate, is directly affected by your thyroid, um, and it's your thermostat and furnace of the human body. Now, it also works hand in hand with your adrenal glands. So if you have adrenal fatigue, your thyroid is gonna be impacted by that. So if you don't feel like, or if you have cortisol issues and you also have, uh, you're gonna find that your thyroid is affected. Okay, it also keeps your moods happy and balanced and helps you sleep deeply and helps your digestion. So if you have overactive digestive issues underactive digestive issues, some of that could be attributed to this in your neck, <laughs> which is amazing to me. Okay, so um, it also controls how quickly the body makes and uses energy and makes protein and how sensitive the body is to other hormones. So um, that's just the 101 on thyroid. Like I said, it is, it had all of these symptoms, are this, a lot of the, are the same symptoms we talked about with insulin. They are very real and a lot to do with your thyroid. So um, here's a, just a little visual of where it's at. So your Adam's apple is your larynx, and just under that is your thyroid. And it, it just uh, but it wraps around. And if it's oh, if it's all swollen down there, you might have a problem. Oh, I think mine's okay. <laughs> okay. So there's two types of issues that we come into contact with thyroid disease. Uh, hypothyroidism, which means that it's overactive. So your thyroid is producing too many hormones. Uh, Graves' disease, 
um, toxic adenomas, which is nodules developed on the thyroid gland, subacute thyroiditis, and pituitary gland malfunctions or, cath or cancer that is growing on the thyroid gland. Now, um, any of those can cause your thyroid to just overproduce it. And you're going to find a lot of those symptoms. Uh, I have a little graphic later that shows some of the symptoms of both of these. Now, the other side of the coin is hypothyroidism, and that means you don't have enough thyroid hormone produced. And that's more what we see when we're, we're uh, talking about weight gain and, and uh, sluggishness and things like that. But Hashimoto's thyroiditis is basically your body attacks the thyroid, an autoimmune disorder. There's many autoimmune disorders, but Hashimoto's is a very common one that we're dealing with with low thyroid. Uh, if you've had your thyroid removed, have here in that. And uh, some people, uh, exposure to uh, high amounts of iodide and also lithium has caused hypothyroidism. So there's many causes of hypothyroidism. And um, this little graphic here, this is Brooke Burke. Yeah. She's on Dancing with the Stars. And so we all, a lot of us heard about the fact that she had nodules growing on her thyroid loss during the last season of Dancing with the Stars. And so, um, this graphic is great because it shows the, the two sides of hypo, uh, thyroid, thyroid disease. We have hypothyroidism. You're going to see dry, coarse hair, loss of eyebrow hair, a puffy face. You can also have a goiter with that. We have a slow heartbeat, meaning that you have bradycardia, which is you know your heart rate is really slow. Arthritis, cold intolerance, depression, di dry skin, fatigue, forgetfulness, heavy menstrual periods infertility, muscle aches, weight gain, and constipation. Now, on the other side of the coin, the hyperthyroidism, which is an overproduction of thyroid hormone, you're going to see hair loss, bulging of the eyes, very uh, sweating, enlarged thyroid, also uh, maybe goiter with that, rapid heartbeat, difficulty sleeping, heat intolerance, infertility, irritability, muscle weakness, nervousness, scant men menstrual period is, periods, weight loss, and frequent bowel movements. So your stomach is just whoo, going like crazy. And then uh, warm most palms and tremor of the hands. So with with those, um, you know, there's a lot of the similar side of, you know, like symptoms, but you, like someone that has hyper, just think of them being hyper. <laughs> like, you know, and then hypo is kind of where you're a little more, you know, just do do do, kind of really tired type thing. So if you're, most of, most of the patients that, you know, um, I know that are suffering with weight gain, things like that, we're mostly dealing with underactive thyroid. Now, if you have unexplained weight gain, you know, you just haven't really been doing much different, but you're just gaining like, like crazy. Um, you also have depression, exhaustion, you're just not very interested in anything anymore. You probably wouldn't be here <laughs> if you were depressed or exhausted um, because you just don't care. And uh, you have cold feet, cold hands, tingling in the arms, um, dry or pale skin, coarse and thinning hair, brittle nails. Uh, some of the time, your skin does not turn over like it should when you have low thyroid. So you, you'll see like you know, a lot more flaky skin, or you, you can get the, the patches on your elbows and on your heels and things. Your skin is just not turning over. Like, it's not regenerating as quickly as it can because the metabolism is slowed down. Uh, puffy eyes, memory loss, constipation, insomnia. Um, you think you'd be able to sleep all the time if you had a lot of thyroid, but honestly, I guess yeah, it, it causes you not to be able to just, just go. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, thinning of the outside of the eyebrows. So like if you just all of a sudden like, man, where'd my eyebrows go, you know? That's that's one another sign. So, um, so let's quickly go over some of the tasks. I listed a lot of them on here. Uh, the main ones that I wanna to talk to you about are um, TSH, T4, and T3. So uh, TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, um, it's kind of backwards because High TSH means that you have low thyroid function. So if your TSH comes back as high, that's not good. Okay. If it is high, that means that you, it's, it's thyroid stimulating hormone. It's telling your thyroid, come on, come on, you can do this, you can make some. And if it's not, 
producing is going to be high because it keeps on telling it to make more thyroid and it's not making more thyroid. So when your TSH is high, that sh indicates a problem. Vice versa, if it's low, it will it means that it could possibly mean that you're dealing with overactive thyroid. Now T4, uh, you actually have you can have a couple different types of tests. The typical one is T total T4. And then uh, one that's supposed to be even better is free T4. So both of those tests, uh, if it's high, it indicates overactive thyroid, and if it's low, indicates that you have underactive thyroid. So if it's, if your numbers come back low on your T4, that's a sign that you might have you might need some extra you need some thyroid medicine, okay, or you need to do things that will help. Um, increase your thyroid. Now if it's high you're going to see the symptoms that are showing hyperthyroidism that include anxiety, unexplained weight loss, tremors, and diarrhea. Those are those are when it's overactive but underactive is, is just the lethargy and the, the others that we talked about. Now like I said free T4 represents the T4 that's available in your body. It's a, just a different measure. It's supposed to be better. It's a little more a lot of times you have to ask for that specifically from your doctor. Um, I'm not sure which one Tammy does here, but I know that um, if you, the big thing is you have to be your own advocate with like your testing. You need to know, you know, like once you're really starting to feel like you have a problem, make sure you research the different types of tests, talk to the doctor about what types of tests they do, and make sure if you still, if your numbers come back totally normal, and they're like, no, nothing's wrong with you, but you go like, I feel like something's wrong with me. Make sure you keep pushing, you keep pushing. Say, okay, well, I want the free one. I want, I want to try one of these other tests and see, you know, is there any other test or can we just try taking some medicine and see if that makes me feel better? You know, different things like that. So now T3 is the counterpart to T4 and um, it's usually, order, it, I know, I think Tammy runs it here and typically it's only an issue when your uh, T4 and TSH suggest an overactive thyroid. So if it's showing that you might have Graves disease or it's showing that you that you have an overactive thyroid, hyperthyroidism, then um, then you'll have that test um, run. And, and several of these other ones also. Now there's some other blood tests, like you can just get as complicated as you want to. A lot of them are to pinpoint more what the problem is. It's not just to you know say overall general. Overall generally, if your TSH and T4 are showing problems, that's the main ones that doctors cue off most often. Okay, now there's other tests too, like um, you know, visual tests like nuclear scans, CT scan, and MRI, and thyroid ultrasound. So you know, you can get as deep into it as you need to. Endocrinologists will really get into it if they really need to pinpoint what's going on, and especially like in cancer situations and things like that. So just so you know and are aware of those, but like I said, TSH and T3 and T4 are the main ones you wanna know about. Okay, and the other side of it is you need to do a complete evaluation of your thyroid. You know, you need to, to feel it, you need to listen to it, you need to uh, pay attention to what your heart rate's doing, pay attention to what your blood pressure's doing. If your blood pressure is really low all the time, that's a sign that you might have uh, underactive thyroid. So, um, if you have unexpected weight gain or weight loss, if you're always cold, um, blood body temperature. If you wake up in the morning, you take your body temperature and it's always low, that's another sign that you have underactive thyroid. So you also examine your face, uh, look at your eyebrows, look at if it's puffy. If you have like this stare in your eye, like you're like spaced out all the time, people are like going, what's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're if you uh, have some hoarseness, different things like that, and then uh, if your hair, you know, the quality and quantity of your hair, if you're starting to see your hair fall out and things, that's a sign of possible thyroid issues. And uh, you know, if you're um, like we talked about your skin, and then your fingernail, fingernails and fingertips. Um, sometimes when you have thyroid issues, your fingernails will separate from the nail bed and so it, and they get swollen things like that so there's you know, definitely um, all sorts of things show up all over your body because it regulates everything okay so now let's just talk about how we can produce more thyroid naturally we can do things through our diet to help promote um, production iodine is needed for your thyroid to be produced so anything that has iodine in it is very 
helpful to your thyroid function. Kelp and seaweed, mmm, yummy. <laughs> Sounds so good. But I, it's found in the Asian Isle of the health food store typically, and you know, there's a lot of stores carrying um, those items nowadays. Also, onions, artichokes, pineapple, of all things, have a lot of iodine in them. Also, there's a supplement called Idoral. It's I O D O R A L. And you can get it online, uh, and maybe at many health food stores. I'm not sure around here, but I know you can get it on Amazon. Uh, 150 micrograms a day um, can help, you know, your iodine. Um, most of us do eat have salt that has iodine in it. it, or if you are if you switch to eating sea salt, make sure that you have, you know, possibly some iodine in that, or make sure that you are getting some because. It's very rare in, in the foods that we eat. So just uh, if you, especially if you're having issues. Another item, uh, another mineral, selenium, is one that you need for uh, thyroid production. And in this region, we have very little selenium in our ground, in our earth. So if you eat a lot of foods that are you know, grown at a farmer's market, or if you have things that are grown locally, be aware that we don't have much selenium in our soil. So you won't be getting it when you eat those foods. So be, be careful that you, you make sure you can also supplement with that. But um, you know, pasture-raised eggs, you know, in this area, if you're having eggs from here, not sure that that will you know, be very, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some in there, but not as much as maybe some other regions. Shellfish, mushrooms, garlic, sunflower seeds, and Brazil nuts. The, those are very good selenium-rich foods. So, um, then we also have uh, copper and iron help you produce thyroid. So there's, uh, you know, once again, some nuts, cashews, and then um, iron-rich foods. Uh, we all know uh, meats, a lot of meats have it in there, but organ meats, like liver, is one of the best things you can eat for iron. <laughs> That's actually, it's very good for you, but we all just know how much we love liver. So, um, liver and other organ meats, oysters, red meat, beans, and leafy green vegetables. So, anything that you know that has copper and iron. And copper is one of those, those minerals that is very important to get that we don't think about very often. So, typically, if you're taking a good multivitamin, they'll have copper in there. And you don't need a ton of it, just a very little bit. Okay, and then we also have essential fatty acids, omega-3s, and I, I know that um, Tammy's a big proponent for fish oil. Uh, if you, you know, there's several forms. Uh, krill oil is also uh, very similar to fish oil, so or it's a type of fish oil. So uh, dark leafy, leafy vegetables, flaxseed, chai seeds, those are great also for um, insulin. So, you know, if you, a lot of the same things that you're doing for your insulin is very good for your thyroid. And salmon and other fatty fish. So, you know, some, I like sardines. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> or kippered snacks, you know, those type of things. Or salmon, you know, the fatty fishes, don't be afraid of eating some of those because that's how you get fish oil just naturally. is very good for you. Okay. Now, medications for thyroid. Many of these are synthetic, okay? Synthyroid, levoxyl, levothyroid, and then it goes on and on. Cytomel is um, another one that is uh, it's synthetic, but it's just uh, it's more popular than than some of the other ones, at least for Tammy's uh, use. But the biggest one that she likes prescribed most is mm -hmm. Armour, mm -hmm. and Armour is a natural. It's from pork, though. So if anyone has issues like food sensitivities with pork or allergies or you know personal reasons why you don't want to ingest pork, um, the other opp opportunity for you to get some thyroid is just a compounded natural. And that's a combination of T4 and T3 in a ratio that is specific for you. So um, definitely all of these are, you know, Synthyroid and Armour, I would say, are the two most popular ones in the, in the world. Um, armor, as far as I'm concerned, is great as long as you don't have any sensitivities. And then uh, the compounded natural, that's always another alternative. So big, big thing with this is that there's alternatives. So if you try to take one type and you have a bad reaction to it, it doesn't feel like it's working, 